Welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is Anthony and Tony, and we have a show for you. Before we get started on the show, don't forget we have a Paranormal Roundtable group on Facebook. Go join, and people tell stories and all kinds of stuff on there. We also have Paranormal Lounge, which is run by Nelly and Paranormal Prayer Group, and the Wolf, uh, what is it, Josh Wolf Turner fan page. Yeah. Which is run by Phil Stern and I th- who else? Curtis Turner, Chris Clough. I don't know some of those guys. Yeah, it's those, I think it's those main guys. Those guys, um, where they do all kinds of stuff on there. So go join that, and then we have a holistic healing group. I think that Nelly has created. I think I know we do. And then don't forget if you're interested in becoming a uh, Patreon member, you can join 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollar tiers. 40 and 50 dollars get you one of my books if you're 40 and 50 if you if, uh, both of them if you're 50. And the 30 dollar tier gets you a much bigger swag bag than the 10 and 20 dollar tiers basically and you all of them you'll get a book. You get two books on the 30 dollar tier of of different authors and then the 40 will get you one book from the authors and one from me. And then you get one book from one of the authors and then two books from me if you're the $50 tier. So that's what that is. And the hoodies and as well, right? You get a hoodie, yeah, because the hoodies are, are going to be out already. So that's the, that's another reminder. Go, go ahead and check out the merch store because the hoodies are out now. So And you can only get the, the zip-up hoodies if you go to the merch store and buy yeah. one. Those aren't going to be given out. Th- those we're, we're still trying to give the the regular pullover hoodies mm-hmm. away, but you can get those. But but only way to get those is if you join the Patreon. Uh, we don't do those on the giveaway, uh, but we will be doing the giveaways every Friday. So ch- ch- uh, tune in on Fridays where we have a guest on YouTube. It's a YouTube exclusive. Then on s- Sunday we have uh, the. Another live stream where we have on Sunday where we just retell people's stories, and those typically go for like three hours. Yeah, I mean, they both do. And they're, they're, that, the Sunday show in particular are usually a little bit more uh, story-oriented and in detail where we kind of just throw ideas around. So if that's it, your kind of thing, then check it out. Um, also, don't forget that you know if you ever want to find any of our links to either the Patreon or the show, to check the description, we have all that set up right there for you, Anthony. Make sure to put it in there every week. So check that out. Josh Turner at prtpodcast dot com. That's how you can get a hold of me. Um, the other thing you can do is hit me up on Messenger through Facebook. That's what a lot of people do. I'm not really accepting friend too many friend requests on Facebook. I have to really vet it because we've had some issues. But uh, hopefully that's that's over. But go check it out, and and you won't be disappointed if you check out the live streams. Everybody seems to really like the live streams. The like I said, the way to support us and help us out is through the Patreon. Also, hit me up if you're interested in being a supporter um, of the board game. We're trying to get that launched and done. We are looking for investors and or anybody who wants to donate to help. So we can get that done. And if you're an investor, we will definitely get your money back to you because we we plan on actually doing very well with this. I think it's a very neat game, neat idea. It's Nelly. And then you guys helped out. So, And don't forget to go to Amazon and buy my books. It's Christmas time, so you better go get those books to give away at Christmas. I've already had a few people tell me that they're giving people my books for Christmas. So Werewolves and the Dogman uh, – Phenomena and then the Bigfoot phenomena. My great goodness. So, yep. So, go get your PRT merch and the books and give them away for Christmas. Don't be stealth, selfish. Don't be greedy. <laughs> One of my bosses used to, used to say that he was the greediest guy in the world. And he would tell me, don't be greedy. He'd tell all of us not to be greedy. <laughs> I'm like, well, just let me take your money. Don't be greedy. Why do you want to get paid for work? <laughs> You got to let me have all the greed. Yeah, and, and he actually, him too, he had a tow yard. He had a, a salvage yard, which is, we're going to start off talking about that tonight. Last week, we talked about a haunted, if you want to call it, it's more than haunted. It was just downright diabolical junkyard that we, it was in. It was down in Durango, Mexico. What, what I'm going to tell you now, though, is in these, these two brothers, Alonzo and Ramon, that reached out to me through a listener of mine and thank you for that to that listener for for her telling them to come to us one of the things i'm going to tell you they did some research on that land 
before it was ever used as a junkyard. And apparently what had happened there was the Mexican government at one time had used it as a jail or like a stockade for, for military, a military prison. So there was a military prison supposedly that was there in that area of that region. And so a lot of people died there and a lot of people were shot there. They would put people before a firing squad and they would kill them. And so, you know, the area I think was already bad when it's, you know, and then there was a partner of their grandfather's, their grandfather's name was Julio. We talked about that last week. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And so, you know, he ended up having a partner that was cursed, you know, by Brujeria. Um, and so he went to a Culandera, a Culandera, and she had told him, you know, that there was a, that this, that there was, a, it was a curse that was done. He got attacked and mauled by a phantom dog that we talked about on the show last week. And that dog it had a very profound effect on him. Now, what, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about tonight. What we're going to talk about is, is what went on with that whole situation. And we're going to kind of focus the beginning of this anyway. We're going to focus on him. So what happened to him? After the attack that he endured from this dog-like creature, I don't know what you want to call it, he had a series of really, really bad dreams. And in one of these dreams in particular, he saw what looked like an old crone. He woke up. There was something. There was like pressure on his chest, and then he couldn't move. He was immobile. And everybody knows that is sleep paralysis. But when he looked up at what whatever it was, it was sitting on his chest. He saw in, in the face of this thing, they had no eyes, and the tongue was like serpent-like, like it was a forked tongue. And there were these long bony fingers that was attached to this thing's arms. And it basically tried to put one of the fingers into his mouth, like in, 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 into the roof of his mouth. And it, it literally had like, like this, the thumb, what would have been the thumb was like a claw, and it stuck and it stabbed him into the roof of his mouth and then put its other fingers into his eyes and his eye sockets. And it felt like it was trying to pull his head off. And he said he woke up thinking it was just a dream with this stabbing pain in the roof of his mouth. And he realized what he was dealing with and what he was, and he looked up and he saw this hollowed out eyes and this forked tongue that was like blackish purple flicking itself in and out of its mouth. And he said, dude, I, I just started swinging on it. He's like, I just <laughs> I started punching it. And he goes, and I hit it several times. And he said, it felt like, just like you would think of like some bony old thing, you know, I was hitting it. He goes, and then the last punch I swung so hard, I wrenched my back. Um, this was like after he got out of the hospital and his wounds were still healing. He goes, and I had st stitches, you know, and so I swing and I open my stitches up, swinging so hard at this thing, and then it was gone. He goes, but then I go to the bathroom and I thought, man, what a dream, but there's a stabbing pain in the roof of my mouth. He goes in there and he rinses out his mouth and he spits blood into the sink. So this wasn't just an illusion. This really happened. And he thought, dude, what in the hell was that? What was that? You know? So this went on the like nightly for like, like weeks like he said dude he would wake up and he would either see this demonic female standing at the foot of his bed or she would be like in the in the mirror either full on or behind him he would see it when he got out of the shower it would sit on his chest it would do all kinds of stuff to him tried to suffocate him with a pillow and a, and a sheet or a blanket he couldn't get out and so what ended up happening, he goes to the priest, finally says, I was not religious at all. I did not believe in God. I didn't have any religion. He's like, you know, he told his grandsons he didn't know if he believed in God. And I said, well, he better start. <laughs> it's like, he finally did. He went to the priest and he got a rosary from the priest and he got holy water. And the priest was actually a very good guy. And he became friends. His name was Ricardo. And he said, Ricardo told him, look, I don't care what you believe in. Okay. You don't need to believe in the devil. He believes in you. And he said, and what you're dealing with is a demon. And he goes, and you need to get rid of it. And so he told him exactly what to do. So he goes to the feed store and he gets a bag of salt or the, the, the dry goods store or whatever. And, and he gets a bag of salt and he spreads it on the outside of his house. He had, a little, he had a little small two bedroom house. And then he puts it in the corners of his house. He does everything he's supposed to do. He puts holy water. And so even then after the prayer, he's like, I prayed. But he really, I really didn't believe it, you know. 
but I thought it couldn't hurt. He goes, oh, it hurt. It hurt a lot because this thing seemed like it was more agitated. And he said that this thing took a candle. He was burning candles at the edge of his bed on, on this like trunk he had. And this thing took the candles, physically grabbed the candles and threw them onto the bed, lit his bed on fire uh-huh. and gave his his lower legs like second degree burns that, that his grandsons had said that he had for years that were, his legs were burned from this entity that had done this. And in the meantime, his business was falling into into debt, and his brother wasn't really good at what he was doing. His brother liked to drink and not really wasn't taking care of the business. They had a partner that had joined, but he got really sick. He got the flu, and he ended up like going into the hospital and was like in the hospital for a long time because he got really sick with like this upper respiratory infection that was caused by the flu, turned into pneumonia and almost died and blah, blah, blah. And so he was having a really bad time. What he eventually happened, his girlfriend that became his wife, that became his the, their grandmother, the boys, she turned him around. She, they got together. She had a messed up experience in that junkyard. She told uh, them about it. And of course, we talked about it on the show. And <clears throat> when they were trying, he was, she was trying to explain what happened to her, to explain Gloria's experience. What was so profound about it, though, was Ramon was the, the, was the first one to get saved and become a, a follower of Christ in the truest sense, not just the baptism, you know, where they do, like some people, they're Baptist or they're Catholic, and they just get baptized, and they don't care about being saved. But he actually went and got saved, and he joined a non-denominational church, which he still goes to to this day. Um, it's actually a Pentecost, I guess. But he said that, you know, he he his grandmother told him, she's like, you're not a real Christian. She's like, you need to believe in Christ. You really need to do this the correct way. And so she went and she got her grandmother who went way back as far as like being a healer and said that even that Kulandera that he had went to wasn't a good person, was not. And not only did she not help him with this curse, she just told him about it, whatever, but she was friends with the person that threw the curse on him. So she had taken... She said, what did this woman ask for? Because he said she asked for three things. And she asked him for a lock of his hair. Yeah. A little drop of his blood. Yeah. Yeah. Real real smart, right? Real smart. And a picture of himself. (laughs) So she's like, great. So you gave her everything she needed basically to curse you even and to drive it home. And so he did that. He gave her everything. And so this is what was going on. So they, she went over there with her grandmother, and this grandmother knew this woman, and she confronted her. And he said right before his eyes, this woman that he had gone to, get this, she looked like she was 40 years old. He said that she put her right hand over her head and says, I renounce you in the name of the Most High God and his son, Jesus Christ. And that woman turned into this old just decrepit looking crone. And so when they got in the in the car and they drove off, his girlfriend, who became his wife, you know, became the, the mother of his children um, and the grandmother of Alonzo and Ramon, she said, she's like, that, that, that woman, you know, he goes, he told her, he said, what, she looks old. And he's like, well, what did you see? He's like, I, I don't know. She looked like she was in her late 30s, early 40s. She goes, oh, no, no, no. Teresa, that was her name. He's like, I've been, she's like, I've been knowing her for about 50 years. He's like, we met when we were in our twenties. She's like, she's in her seventies. And then his girlfriend was kind of puzzled. She's like, she looked, she looked like a young woman to you. And he was like, yeah. He's like, in fact, I thought she was kind of pretty, you know, and she kind of, you know, had come on to him or whatever. And his girlfriend was like, don't tell me that you were, you know, he's like attracted to her. And he goes, no, 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 I wasn't attracted to her. He didn't admit it, but he was like, no, I thought she was hot. And it turns out she wasn't hot. She was just really ugly old crone that was, you know, shining him on, pretending like, you know, she was, she was something she wasn't. So he was just like in shock. And he was like, dude, this is, you know, he was baffled, you know? So he told his grandsons and, and his granddaughter, he was like, this is, He's like, this is something I, I don't know, man. He goes, it was weird. You know, it was so weird. So 
the 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 one one night and it was Christmas Eve and they were telling stories, right? And I think this is kind of cool because this is Christmas time, right? And I, th- I thought it was a very unique story because I've never heard a story like this from Mexico. But his daughter, uh, or not his daughter, his um, yeah, well, yeah, his daughter's daughter, I guess it would be. He's got one daughter. That would be their aunt and their first cousin. She had a, a, a weird experience. So it was Christmas Eve and they had told this story, you know, and the grandmother and the grandfather were telling everybody stories and they were eating like cookies and whatever and and drinking, uh, what's it called? The yeah, Horchata. Yeah, the horchata. And they're drinking horchata and they're having, they're, they're having fun, whatever. And they're talking and singing songs. Well, she starts getting really ill and she doesn't feel good. That's their cousin. That's their aunt's uh, daughter. And she decides to go to bed. She wakes up screaming at the top of her lungs. She's a little younger than they are. They're like in their teens. She's like 12. They run into the bedroom where she's at. And this green snake, like they had never seen before. And it looked very viper-like, you know. And they described it like they, working in that junker. They've seen a lot of snakes. And they're like, you can tell which ones are poisonous, which ones aren't. This one had a viper head on it. And it crawled out from underneath the bed and disappeared out the window and was gone. And she freaked out. She gets out of the bed and this thing had struck her on the inner side of her leg. So they ru- rush her to the hospital. She lingered between life and death for like two weeks. You know, she was in the hospital. And of course, not so much fun for Christmas. And they still to this day don't know what that snake was or how it got in the bed or what it was doing in that bed. But it happened after they, uh, whatever, but they talked about it. But one of the clues, and this is what I think happened because they told me this could be an, an, an answer. The woman that had, that had solidified the curse on him, that he had gone to help remove the curse. He went to this woman. She solidified it, Teresa, right? She had two pet snakes that she kept, right, in her living room. And one of them was black and one of them was green. And supposedly these snakes were from the jungle. They don't know where, maybe down in the Yucatan or whatever. They're not real sure. But uh, when he described it to me, I started doing a little research. And I don't know if this is correct, but I, I and I don't know that it, this was a poisonous snake from the jungle in South America, but I think it could have been from Africa. And I'll tell you what it looks like to me. It looks like this, and you guys can see that an eastern green mamba. Oh, okay. Now, if you do some research on the eastern green mamba, it's found in southeastern Africa, and the description that they gave. From what, you know, and so there would have been no cure for this. And by all means, their cousin should have died from it. Her name was Amy, but she lived. And the the scary, sad part about all this is that this woman that put the curse on him at this point in time, she was dead. She had been dead for years. So what do you make of that? I mean, this woman would have been gone a long time. So there was a snake there, and it was after he had told the story about her. So a little bit of spiteful revenge from the grave. I mean, what could that be? And I thought that was an interesting story, but she she supposedly had a black one too. Now there's a black mamba too. And these are native to Africa, and they are deadly snakes. Uh, every year people die being bitten by these snakes. What... What's so weird about it when you're dealing with people who practice the black, the dark, whatever, you know, you don't know what they're going to have or what they're going to do because they have access to things that you and I would not even think about because, well, for one thing, I mean, they can, there's different ways that they can travel, you know, and do things. They don't have to actually leave to go places uh, like on a plane, train, or automobile. And from what they understand, this woman had never left their village. Like she had always been there. Like she, that nobody ever remembers her ever not being there. So when she passed away, she when she died, she had no family, no friends, and and it was just customers that would come to her every now and then. 
but but after the incident that happened with his wife, which became his wife's grandmother, you know, th- this woman, like literally her house was left in desolation and ruin. There was nothing left of her. Nobody went to her anymore, and they knew that she wasn't a healer. She was a, a, a witch, and she practiced black magic. And a lot of the people that she supposedly healed would be okay in, you know, for a little while in the short run, and then the long run, they'd get really sick. And some of them would even die and develop like cancers and things like that. So people started to put two and two together and figured out, hey, man, this woman is not, you know, this is probably what happened because they would get sick then they'd go back to her. Then she'd heal them for a little while. Then they'd get sick and they'd go back to her. And it was a vicious cycle. So she was basically grifting these people. But uh, eventually that was broken when they went to the neighboring village and got, you know, this woman's grandmother to come and she just put her hand on her head and that was it. She was done. And he always told them that it was a testament to the power of God. And after that, oh, he became a Christian like big time and he followed Christ for the rest of his life. And there was a story that happened to him. He was in what they, what we called in the last episode, the dead zone. And he went into the death zone, death zone, whatever, to drop a car off with his, uh, his uh, grandson, the one that passed away at the age of 27, unfortunately. And that was Alonzo and Ramon's brother who died in a car wreck, um, tragically. But uh, so they go to drop a car off and lo and behold, sleeping in the back of one of these vehicles is a mangy old dog. And now this guy, after having been attacked by this phantom dog, he was on guard and he took a big old ax handle and was getting ready to whack this dog when it turns And it jumps out of the vehicle before he could even react. And it jumps and it latches onto his arm and takes a bite on him. So this is the second time in his life he's been attacked by a dog. But this is what happened. This dog got loose. He he got it loose from him. He smacked it around. The dog was foaming at the mouth. The dog had rabies. It was a rabid dog. So at that where he was at, he had to go to the main city and he had to get checked. And of course, they said, you're, you're going to have to get rabies shots. And he got rabies shots. And stupidly, he was supposed to go back and get like a second round. He didn't. What? Like Why? He, yeah, he just, well, he just didn't. He just didn't. You know, people do. They don't do what they're supposed to do. And so he didn't go back. So he begins to get sick. And now rabies is characterized as hybrid hydrophobia, you know. And so he began to have all the symptoms of hydrophobia and their hydrophobia is actually one of the symptoms, but the old timers just called it hydrophobia. So his grandfather told me, he's like, you got hydrophobia. It's like, and there's no cure. Once you get to that point, you can't, there's no going back. And the shots he got, it's Mexico. Who knows? Yeah. So he starts to get sick. And when he got to the point where he was just like, he was losing his mind. He went into it. What he felt like was, the death throes, whatever, he was in a coma. And everybody was like, oh, they came, the priest came, gave him his last rites, he's a goner, right? He goes into this coma, but he has a very shallow breathing, a low heart rate, but he doesn't die. And in in this, he has this long-running near-death experience. And when when in this near-death experience, he meets an angel that's what he called himself as the angel of the Lord and tells him, you're not done. You have a lot of work to do. And he's like, at this point, he tells him, he's like, you're going to have to uh, atone for all of your past and all this other stuff. And he's like, what you need to do is you need to start giving your money away. And he's like, and you need to just shed all of the earthly whatever so that when you pass away. And, and this angel told him, he's like, you have two years to do this. He goes, and make sure that you give everything away that you have and you give it all to your grandchildren and everybody you know. And there's nothing left. You don't have anything left. And there's nothing in this this world that holds you to this world. He's like, you will be in this this year, two years from now. You're gonna be you're gonna be passing over. So you have to cleanse yourself. You have a lot of forgiving to do. He's like, you have a lot of people you haven't forgiven for past transgressions. You're hanging on to things. And so the next year, he tells everybody. He's like, once he comes out of this coma, he lives. It's like a miracle, right? And he says, dude, you know, he goes, uh, this angel came to me 
It was yellowish white angel that was bright and shiny. I, I never could even see his face and told me that I have to give away everything. So he gives his son his business. He, sh- he takes everything out of his name, gets it to his sons, his grandchildren, passes everything on and just lives the rest of his life going to church and and even goes and like goes to neighboring towns and like does all these like food drives and you know he helps people with 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 everything like does everything he's supposed to do the next year comes up and about 3 or 4 days before the date that he was supposed to pass away he tells everybody goodbye and they're just like thinking okay he's he's lost his mind this isn't you know this isn't real and then the day that he's supposed to pass away right then I mean the day to, to the day when he says i'm going to die he goes and he sits out in his car and the next thing you know, he's slumped over in the car and they hear the horn and they go out there because they thought he was going to go to the store and they thought he's just, you know, he's full of crap. They go out there and he's gone. He's passed away. And that was it. You know, his life was over and he had given away everything he owned, even his house and his, his wife, you know, she, she, they gave it to the daughter and, they, they divided up the, the stuff to their sons and everything. And the mo- and the, the grandmother was aggrieved, but she knew it. She said that, you know, Julio was not a liar and that she believed every bit of it that he was going to pass away and that it was meant to be that way. The angel told him, he's like, you were not meant to die. You had two years. We're giving you two years to do what you have to do to get your affairs in order. And that the dog that bit you was, was there to do that. And that was going to be the end of it. And God didn't want him to die in sin. So, and he wasn't living his life correctly. He had a, a problem. He still drank a little bit and he had a problem with uh, wanting money. Like he was, you know, like, what are you going to do with this money? You can't take it with you. And so that was a very interesting story. I thought that was very uh, unique in, in the way that he passed away. And it was, you know, one thing I did learn though about some of these people and their stories you know, they'll give you a story or an encounter. But then if you dig in, they have encounters from people from their family. They have friends and other people who've had stories. And a lot of times they've had a lot of weird stuff happen to them, you know, just that, that centers around their family or, or whatever. Yeah. And this is one of those situations where I just kept digging deeper and deeper and I got more. So that that's that family story and that's kind of the end of their stuff. But they gave me a story from a friend that he met when he was in Arizona. And this guy, he, he's from Mexico too, but he lived in the United States for 27 years. Uh, he was around to see the Cowboys win the Super Bowl <laughs> uh-huh. in 1995. So he's been around for a long time. <laughs> uh, so anyways, this guy, he, he's been in here for a long, long time. And I interviewed him. His name is Mario. And Mario and me kind of hit it off, and he was a, he was a nice guy. But he, what he saw, and we're going to switch up gears a little bit because he was from that same region. He was driving down an old dirt road in that same region of Durango, and when he was eighteen years old, he was courting a girl who was the love of his life, who ended up marrying and being with. He's been with her for for thirty years, and or thirty two years, whatever. And he says, man, when we were first dating, he goes, we went down this lover's lane, you know, this area where we would go and we'd park. And there was a legend out there of this creature that was hooved that looked like a bull, but it would run around on two legs. And so I thought, oh boy, I was like, have we finally gotten a Minotaur story here? I was like, this is it. This is crazy. This is a Minotaur story. So he pulls in and he says, dude. I heard the stories and they call this thing El Toro, the bull, you know? And he said, dude, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe in any of this crap. I thought this is just a story. And anybody who encounters this thing is probably, they're probably high on grass. Yeah, they're seeing something That's what he told me, his exact words. He goes, man, there's somebody encountering that. They're high on grass, man. They're smoking, you know, mota. And so I told him, I said, well, were you? And he goes, "Um, No. (laughs) He goes, nope, nope, nope. He goes, I was sober. And I went out there. He goes, I had a job to do, and that was to try to get my first kiss from this girl, you know? And so he's like, uh, I go out there, and I park, and I'm all of 18 years old, and I think, you know, I'm going to, you know, talk to this girl, you know, and it's going to be all good. But she wasn't having it, you know, because I kept trying to reach in and kiss her, tried every trick in the book. He's like, and this girl, she kept pushing me away. She was like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not like that, whatever. 
And so he started getting aggravated and he said, you know, I was about to give up. He's like, and then she's staring out the window and there's this awkward silence. And uh, he says, you know, I guess I'm just going to take you back home. And she's like, good, whatever. You know, he's like, she's just like kind of a little too, he was a little too pushy and she was, you know, he had liked her for a long time since they were like young, you know, and she had finally come around and was interested in him. You know, she'd been dating this other guy when they were teenagers and for a long time. And that guy was a douchebag. And so he thought, well, I guess I blew it. I'm done. This girl's not going to. And the next thing you know, she's like, oh my God. And she jumps into his lap and he's like, wow, that was quick. That was quick. <laughs> you know, she, she did an about face and he's like, she's straddling me and she's on top of me and she's like hugging me for dear life. And then I realized she's not trying to get fresh with me. She saw something. He's like, and I look over and in the darkness, I see this thing come up over this hill and then kind of disappear. And he said, dude, it looked just like a bull in the face with these big, thick horns. But he goes, I could have swore it was on two legs. And he's like, no way. No way did I just see this, the, the bull, you know, that everybody talks about. And he goes, and then he's like, I turn the car, I start to turn the car on and he, she's like, oh my God, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. So he pushes her off of him and he says, all right, all right, calm down. I got to, you know, let's, let's get out of here. And he's like, I'm driving my dad's car. He goes, and right in front of me, full on in front of me, this brownish looking creature comes running out of the darkness and bam, just slams its hands right down on top of the hood. And dude, he goes, it put... Two the, the 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 hood flipped inward and put two huge dents on this big old car's hood, this Oldsmobile, his dad's car. He's like, and dude, and the car came up off the ground. And he's like, this thing reached down and like lifted up the, the car like with one arm and just kind of pushed it up and it fell up and down like it bounced. He's like, and my head flew up and hit the the, the roof of the car and I hurt my neck. He goes, To this day, I have a problem with my neck. He's like, I was working out at the gym, you know, and he goes, and I, my, my neck, I strained my neck. He goes, and the doctor said I had some sort of slip disc in there. And he's like, and I think it happened because of this damn bull man. <laughs> That's what he said, you know? And so Mario goes, dude, I start the car and, and, I, and I just start to drive out of there. And as I'm driving out, this thing starts running behind the car. And he said, and I said, what did it look like exactly? He goes, dude, just like you would imagine like a minotaur, like a bull on its back legs, they had these weird, you know, like cow legs. He said cow legs. And he said, but it was like, you know, like a bull. And it had these big, thick thighs and this, this skinny lower, the lower part of the legs, just like, like a bovine animal. And it had these big, thick arms and this huge muzzle. The head was huge. And it had these big curved horns. They came up at to, to these points that kind of curved outward. He's like, and when it ran, it was running super fast. He's like, and it kept reaching for the back of my car. And then it would like, I would, I would just speed up. And I, he goes, I was going dangerously fast and it just kept getting closer and closer. And it was almost to the back of my car to where it could reach the trunk and try to pull my car. And he goes, and then it dove toward my car and I just kept going and I saw it hit the ground and then roll. And then it just kind of popped right up, like just boom, you know, like a spring. And he's like, and so I, I, I tell my friends, I told my friends the next day, he's like, I told him, I said, dude. I, I told my friend Oscar, he says, I saw this thing out there, you know, where everybody parks or whatever, you know, and, and, and he says, yeah, my brother saw that. So he asked his brother and his brother told him, he goes, yeah, I've seen this, this uh, creature, you know, he said that one night his, then this is the story. I think his name was Gilbert. He was out there, uh, you know, partying, hanging out with a bunch of friends, drinking a few years before. And he was a little bit older than, than, than Mario. And he said, dude, I'll tell you, my brother saw it, you know, so his brother tells him the story and he had heard a little bit of it, but he never put any stock into it. You know what I mean? Kind of like with me, with the dog, man, you know, I never put any real stock into, into what it was or what it could have been. I just heard people say, Hey, there's this thing, you know, people say things, dude, and you don't know. I mean, you, you know, unless you see it, like you don't know if it's real, you don't know if there's whatever. And you just kind of take it for granted that it's people talking. But his, 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 his brother's friend told him a very, very creepy story. They were out there and they were drinking and hanging out. And this thing comes up out of the, like over, over this ridge, this little hill, and it's standing there and it's about eight feet, eight foot tall. And they, they estimate that it weighed probably a thousand pounds. 
It was just huge, like muscled up bull looking creature with these really big like hands. And he said that it was just gigantic and it had these big, big legs and it just was just mean, nasty looking creature. And it literally grabbed one of the guys who was from a neighboring town and in front of all of these guys, it took this dude, lifted him up off the ground and then just dropped him over like, like there was like this little, uh, kind of like a fence, you know, that kept you from going off the, the edge of it, yeah. you know? And it dropped him over the, 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 the top of it and broke his back. And so their friends had to grab him and put him in the car. And this thing began to like rampage through their vehicles and just smashing everybody's vehicles and smacking people. And they were going flying like five, 10 feet in the air. And this guy's friend said he was hanging out with people from the neighboring town, right? And he said, dude, uh, you know, he goes, I was right there, my, with, right there with my girlfriend and I watched this thing do this. And he goes, so we, we all get in one vehicle, the ones that could, one of the vehicles that was out on the edge. And we all took off down this gravel road and we go and we tell the federalities like what had happened. And he said, they just sat there and laughed. And we took, you know, our, my brother's friend, you know, to, to the, or my friend's brother that was thrown in the air and dropped over the railing and his back was broken, took him to the hospital. And we were at the hospital. He goes, this doctor comes up and he starts talking to them and he says, what happened to this guy? This guy's, he's paralyzed. He's going to die. You know, he's not going to, he's probably not going to live. Well, he ended up being a, parap a, a paraplegic for the rest of his life and he did live, but the doctor was very curious. And so when they told him what had happened, the doctor said, oh my gosh. He's like, one of my uncles went out there and supposedly in front of like several people, he was murdered. Like he got grabbed and his head was turned around backwards and he was pulled uh, out of this, you know, off of the ridge and down this hill by this creature. And the, the, the police looked into it, but they never did come up with any real answers. They just kept saying it was like this bull man that did it. And they just were like, yeah, bull crap. Yeah. And they never did pursued it or did anything. And so for years and years, there was a legend there and a story but if you were to go and talk to the the local law enforcement, they would just be like, ah, it's mentira, it's a bunch of lies, you know. It's it's just a bunch of drunk kids who go there and they fight and they beat each other up and then they claim that it's the bull man. And there's even a circle that up there, like a dead end now, where they go and they drive up there and kids would actually get out of their vehicle and beat each other up. So they just thought, you know, it was like some sort of initiation thing. And they would just say, oh, well, the bull man did it, you know, because they're in the bull ring fighting. But no, according to the some of the locals, this is a very real thing. And this creature does exist. And it really did do these things to these people. Now, the guy that was murdered there, it was considered an unsolved murder. And it never even made the newspaper. Nobody cared. It was just some poor kid from, a, you know, some from the slums of the town and ended up uh, being murdered by this creature. Because, like I said, things are done a little differently down there. And there's even places in this country where stuff like that happens and nobody cares. You know, it's a poor person. Nobody gives a crap. And so it's a very sad and tragic thing. But as far as I know, to this day, um, the last, the, the, what Mario had told me and, and what, you know, Alonzo and Ramon had said a little bit about it. They'd heard the legends. But they said that as far as they know, that nothing, that nobody has seen this creature since the late 90s. So there haven't been any reports of it. So maybe it moved on or maybe it went back underground or wherever the hell it came from. We don't know. So I, I don't know what happened to this creature. I don't know where it went or what, what became of it. But it is a creepy story. It is an ur uh, kind of an urban legend there. But they claim to know people who actually were killed by it or they know of them, you know. Um, but then again, you know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it is people just beating each other to death and they're just blaming it on that. But it seems like there's a little too many people who've witnessed it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. What What are your thoughts? We'll start with you, Anthony. I mean. <laughs> as far as this Minotaur thing goes, I think that maybe it was retrieved and, and that's why nobody has seen it since the 90s. These creatures can be considered assets by the, by, by the governments of, of the country that they're in. I think this thing was real. I think it was too, and, and and but the thing that you got to remember too is you know you get reports of minotaurs. I mean of uh, 
dog man, you know, reptilians, Bigfoot. You get all these different reports, even centaurs. We've only we've had a f- handful of those, but I don't think we've ever had a minotaur. We've even had goat orc, man, orc like, orc like, you know, yeah. like uh, creatures that look like um, trolls and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, but I don't. I think this is the first well, minotaur yeah, I was story. Say, like finally a minotaur story. Now you hear stories of the minotaur, you know, going back to Tiamat, and we've talked about that on the live stream and on other people's shows. Um, most recently I was on with, uh, uh, what's his name? Tex, Texas front porch. Yeah. Go to T E X apostrophe, uh, S front porch and you'll, and you'll, my, my show was on there. My episode was on there and we talked a little bit about Tiamat at, toward the end of there. We talked about the Anunnaki and the creation, Sumerian creation myth. I, I don't know. You, you, you get these reports of all these different creatures, and then we got that picture that we got sent that was probably from the Vatican. That's really creepy yeah. looking too. Yeah, creepy looking. And you could see this humanness in its face. But it was like a chimeric looking creature that they had, you know, that you you could see that it was probably created like a minotaur was created by a bull and a man. I don't know. I, I mean, and it said that supposedly if this creature was loosed, it would be like, you know, horrible upon mankind because it's just going to kill people because it is a bull. And bulls are cantankerous animals, and if it has a humanness about it, that's a little smarter. Unstoppable. It could, it could, yeah, it could be a serious problem. <laughs> um, not so much with like like a goat or a wolf. It might be a little less uh, aggressive, but a minotaur would be extremely aggressive, a horrific thing, you know, to 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 deal with. Here's like a just a out there theory, right? But like, so to give some examples or. Uh, so we all know that like the, the climate changed so much that the dinosaurs basically died out. Like they, they couldn't just adapt to it. So they well, eventually we, most, the most commonly held belief is that they were killed. A lot of them were killed by an extinction event of an asteroid hitting the Yucatan. And, but I thought that asteroid changed the climate so much that the rest. Well, yeah. Were, after that. Yeah. yeah so nuclear winter. Is it possible that these cryptids. That uh, kind of go come over from this portal, and they like they're they adapted to an environment that is no longer possible. So like they're kind of dying out, and like are they either like escaping back to their old portal, or I mean uh, to their old wherever they came from? And do you think like maybe that's why we, we even though there's very proliferant stories of like minotaurs or like other creatures, you don't see them as much as Bigfoot or lizard men or, or, or maybe they went back men. underground where they came from. Yeah. Like maybe they just returned because like the, the, the environment isn't sustainable for it's their suitable or suitable for their, uh, you know, living anymore. What do you think about that? Because like, well, so you think they're just kind of laying dormant uh, underground or what? Well, maybe, maybe they just like, let's say they went through, a, came from a portal and like they, they came from a portal like way, way, back in the past and then throughout many years they were like we can't keep staying here it's not working anymore for whatever reason let's say like they got just wiped out because they were super aggressive um but in this instance like do you think that like they just left and that's maybe why we don't see them as much anymore do you think that they just don't exist i mean that could be because if you look at ancient uh reliefs and artwork especially Egyptian, but also in other cultures like like Mesoamerican cultures, there's a lot of depictions of humanoid animals. And I think we're too quick to assume that that was some metaphorical depiction of stuff because a lot of their stuff is really not as metaphorical as, as we assume it to be. That's what they were seeing. These were the beings that they were dealing with. It's not like it's all just fantasy and fiction or made up. If you go far back enough in in human history, I think you would find a lot more of these creatures and and they would be they would be considered commonplace if you go far back enough in time, just like the common house cat or dog to us. But for whatever reason we, we really don't see them around, you know, anymore. I mean, we we talk about it a lot in the show, but the similarities between cultures based on their mythologies is just bizarre. Oh well, so, yeah, just like how cultures that have never interacted with one another that like for example, they'll they'll have uh, legends of dragons. Yeah, every culture has got a dragon. Yeah. And every culture has some sort of anthropomorphic something or other. I was thinking about like like the, like the, the Cretan bull, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I think this ties into like our ancient 
cultures, you know, like the Minoans, and of course the hub of their civilization was Crete, and then they and they were the the lords of the Greeks, you know, just like the Etruscans, they lorded over the Latins, which became the Roman people, and they 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 hated the Minoans, and so the the word Cretan became synonymous with a stupid person, but the Cretans were anything but stupid. And they revered and honored this Minotaur, which I believe they they, they named him Torgamir. And of course, <clears throat> they sacrificed to him. They would take people from the mainland Greece, and they were vassal states at that time. This is back before the city states kind of developed into what, you know, their own little kingdoms, Sparta, Thebes, Argos, you know, uh, these different places, Corinth, you know, Athens, they, they became their own whatever, but they, their own autonomy, but they, they were, they were ruled over by the Cretans. And then they had to give, you know, in the spring every year for the, you know, they had to, for the fertility, they had to give up a male and a female. They were put into this labyrinth and were killed by this being. Now, a lot of people will say that's a myth. I don't think it was. I think there was really something there. And there's a reason why, I mean, you, you look there, there were still the ruins of this labyrinth and there was something in there doing something. Um, a lot of historians will say, you know, it was probably just a person dressed up as a, as a bull that would go and it would, it would slay them. But the story is, is pretty clear that this being would kill them and eat them. And if you, um, look at the, the, the Sumerian myth of like, you know, Tiamat, Tiamat being for those of you that just listen to the podcast and don't pay attention to the live stream and I have to educate you because you're special. Uh, just kidding folks. We're glad you're here. Uh, but Tiamat, her son Marduk had murdered her husband. Long story short, she goes and she has these, these several different types of creatures created to get revenge. And one of them was the bull man. Another one was a hairy man. Another one was a scorpion man. And, you know, she had all these different types of creatures. Um, but you see certain ones over and over again, like the hairy man. You know, obviously, to me, that's Bigfoot. Um, the dog man is this, you know, it's just werewolf looking creature. Less prevalent, though, is the minotaur. But I think that that was because if it was a real thing, it probably would have been hyper aggressive. So it would have been something that humans would have gone after and killed. Um, like just kill on sight. You know what I mean? Because the dog man, the goat man, the hairy man, they may just leave you alone, but a bull is going to have so much testosterone, which, oh, which is red. a direct link to aggression, right? Like the bull shark is named that because the, the word bull is synonymous with the big, strong, masculine, testosterone filled, aggressive thing. The bull shark has the highest testosterone of any animal on earth. That's why they're so aggressive. There's hyper aggressive. If you're in the water with a bull shark, it's going to attack you. I mean, it's, there's a good chance it's going to attack you. It's not like a tiger shark or a great white. They're there. They're big, mean, and strong, and they're meaner and stronger. Or they're stronger than a bull shark, but they're not meaner. Yeah. Like that, if, if they had the aggression of a bull shark, we'd be in trouble. You know, nature kind of has a way of putting checks and balances in place. But I just think that this story, to me, is a fascinating one. And uh, it is the only one of its kind so far. I don't. Now, here's the rub. I kept thinking eventually, once I get a story like this, that hopefully someone else will hear it and then they'll come forward and, and they'll be like, oh, I know somebody who heard this, you know, and they'll get me in touch with another hopefully. Uh, I mean, Mario person and that person will like this guy, Mario, and they'll, and they'll be like, tell me the story of what happened to them. Well, we can at least remember this one is our first Minotaur story so that when we hopefully. Or maybe not. Hopefully, get not, some. Not hopefully. <laughs> well, you don't. You don't want to hope that somebody's yeah, had a saying, horrific like story. <laughs> hopefully, not that they don't. But maybe someone just saw it in the distance. That'd yeah, be cool. I'll be but, fine but, yeah. with, with the Minotaur story. I'll be fine with just seeing it in the distance. But but the you know if if it di if you did by any chance happen to see you know something like this, well, please come forward and tell mm -hmm. us. Because, way. we'd love it. Yeah, I, I I've never heard of it before. I've never heard of anybody tell that story. And I don't know too many people who've claimed to have seen this, but it would make sense if it was in other countries because you don't hear about it here in America. Oh, definitely not. No, no, especially but, but, some, you know, very 
rural area like uh, or, or um, uh, the area that it was in, you it would make sense that you would have some creature mm-hmm. that's still able to just hide around and skirt, you know, the government. Yeah, I know a couple Greek people, and I haven't asked them anything. About, <laughs> I was going to say maybe I should ask them if they've heard anything like this. You know, um, that just is the Minotaur a unique creature in mythology, like specifically a cow-headed man. Bullhead. Bull, bullhead. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty unique, but I mean, well, like I mean, I like, said, is it unique to just Greece and then Rome, or is it like, do you find it in uh, like no, China? Sum- I just said like the Sumerian. Okay, like, so that but with that, or, or is, there, is there anywhere else? Because I don't know, like, I'm trying to think of like any Asian myths I have that, no, are, that I've learned of head. that I can think of. I mean, I could do a little bit of research. I, I, I seem to remember something else, but I'm, and I'm racking my brain trying to remember what it was. I mean, I've seen pictures of Oni, and there's definitely some wild-looking Oni. Bottom. Yeah, with the with the horns. Yeah, but nothing bullheaded specifically that I can think of. No, I can't. I don't. I don't know. I can't think off the top of my head. You know, I mean, there's you know, and another creature that was supposedly created by Tiamat and her her uh, army was the uh, merman, the mer creatures. So you have the sea people and you have all these different creatures that were created, you know, based on a war that she was fighting with her son, Marduk. And uh, according to the Sumerian legend, there was an invasion during Marduk's wedding that led to the reptilian, you know, that, that they, now there's all kinds of stories about whether the reptilians were something that was, there's people that believe that they were evolved from the dinosaurs and they live within the earth. And there's people that believe they came from another star system. And then there's some people that believe that that not only did they have a relic population that descended from the dinosaurs, but there were several other species all that have come at different times. Because just like there's a mammalian race like us, there's a, there's there's multiple reptilian races. But as far as wolf head, I mean, uh, wolf head, yeah, but not bullheaded. I haven't really heard of too many. Hmm. You know? That'll be interesting. Like, let us know in the comments if you guys have heard of any stories, like, or, yeah, or any myths at least that are outside of just you know Samaria and Greece. Mm-hmm. Anything else to add before we close it out? Well, that was a pretty good story. I think we I think you guys are gonna like this one tonight. So we're happy you guys joined us. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining Paranormal Roundtable. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And go join our groups and just try to keep abreast of all things Paranormal Roundtable. One of the things I want to say before I close this out, somebody was telling me that, why why do you call it Paranormal Roundtable when you talk a, a lot about cryptids? And I told him, I said, dude, I, we talk about everything in this channel and it is all paranormal. The, the term paranormal, it, it particularly from the cryptid community, they they it's got this connotation that it's like, you know, it's... It's just like about ghosts. You know, that's funny. not correct. And some of these people, they do it on purpose to be snide towards yeah. us. Like, well, that's paranormal. I'm like, yeah. oh, you don't think a, a bullheaded man or a wolf-headed man is paranormal? Well, you know what? You're pretty damn stupid. I well, mean, that's, that's, that's say that. funny because like they both do it to each other. Because like you know, the crypto community be like that. That's paranormal. But then the go- uh, the paranormal community be like, oh, those are, those guys believe in cryptids. They believe in they just believe in monsters, monsters yeah. running around. So like, you guys are both sounding stupid. You're fighting, or like you're two children calling each other names. Well, basically. and both both groups have you know. They, they, they act like we're heretics because we're talking about both because, I mean, somebody needs to point out that this stuff is all part of the same cake. I mean, you know, different part of the cake. I mean, you know, it, it's maybe a different color icing, but it's all the same cake. And so, whatever. You know, you get it from both ends, and you know, and you're never going to please everybody, and there's always going to be haters, but we have a lot more love than we get hate. So thank you for loving us, and thank you for joining us, and please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for tuning in, and please tune in again next week, and the week after that, and the week after that, and the week after that. Keep going on and on. Uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, and then, of course, the live streams on Friday and Saturday. Thank you, and good night. Good night.